precious little dragons welcome back to my channel thank you so much for joining me today this is the first time in a while i have had the time and energy to sit down and film an actual book look so hopefully it goes well because i finished reading this book probably like a month and a half ago so i'm hoping this goes okay the book i am going to be reviewing and creating a look inspired by today is called the last time i lied by riley Secker. We will, here is a quick summary of the last time i lied Two truths and a lie. The girls played it all the time in their tiny cabin in Camp Nightingale. Vivian, Natalie, Allison, and first-time camper Emma Davis, the youngest of the group. The games ended when Emma sleepily watched the girls sneak out of the cabin in the dead of night. The last she, or anyone, saw of them was Vivian closing the cabin door, hushing Emma with a finger pressed to her lips. Now a rising star in the New York art scene, Emma turns her past into paintings. Emma turns her past into paintings, massive canvases filled with dark leaves and gnarled branches that cover ghostly shapes in white dresses. The paintings catch the attention of Francesca Harris White, the socialite and wealthy owner of Camp Nightingale. When Francesca implores her to return to the newly reopened camp as a painting instructor, Emma sees an opportunity to try and find out what really happened to her friends. Yet it's immediately clear that not all is right at Camp Nightingale. Already haunted by memories from 15 years ago, Emma discovers a security camera pointed directly at her cabin, mounting mistrust from Francesca, and most disturbing of all, cryptic clues Vivian left behind about the camp's twisted origins. As she digs deeper, Emma finds herself sorting through lies from the past while facing threats from both man and nature in the present. And the closer she gets to the truth about Camp Nightingale, the more she realizes it may come at a deadly price. That's the first time I've just actually read a synopsis, but I felt like it might be good to actually read a synopsis rather than try and stumble my way through. Okay, so okay, so for my makeup look today, because most of the book takes place at Camp Nightingale, and we get a lot of Emma's very vivid descriptions of the forest and the lake because she's an artist, I am going to be drawing heavily from, you know, the nature aspect, and so I'm going to be largely basing my makeup look on the, like the blues and the greens of the forest and the lake. So that is that is what, where we're starting at. Hopefully it ends up kind of how I how I hope. <laughs> okay, so I'm, as usual, going to do a couple quick thoughts on the book while I get started on my makeup, and then, you know, we can transition sort of into the more spoilery stuff. And because it's a mystery sort of suspense thriller, I, like, I'm going to talk about some aspects of the whodunit, but then I still want to, like, leave enough uh, surprises that if you haven't read the book but you still want to get like my full thoughts that you'll still have a few surprises in there so you know as per usual I'll be careful about kind of what slash how I share so chill all right what am I doing for a primer I don't even know here I think I'm gonna Whoop! you saw nothing two truths and a lie I am not clumsy I <laughs> have blue eyes and <laughs> I have brown hair. I forgot how, like, heavy that primer is. Ooh. Alright, so general thoughts on the book. Honestly, I really liked it. You know, I can handle suspense in books better than I can handle suspense in movies. I don't know why. Like, there were still definitely some moments where I was sort of concerned on the edge of my seat. Definitely did not just knock my laptop off my desk and have a mild, <laughs> have a mild moment of panic thinking I destroyed my, like, $1,300 computer. Holy crap. That was, that was more suspenseful than the whole book. Well, no, actually just more scary than the whole book because it wasn't suspenseful because it all happened in a second. Never mind. Anyway, so, you know, because this book takes place from Emma's perspective, you're sort of getting, you're figuring out things along with her. So you have to kind of gather all the clues alongside of her and because it's a biased narration from Emma's perspective, you tend to sort of lean towards what she's leaning towards and she's she has no clue what's going on. She's trying to unravel this mystery that's been haunting her for 15 years because, you know, she was the only girl that didn't disappear from Camp Nightingale. Kind of the only survivor. It was the reason the camp shut down and so now she's back 15 years later and she views this as a way to kind of get closure. So when she starts off, you know, she's 
like I said, up and coming on the New York art scene. And pretty much all she paints is these giant forest pieces. And basically what she does is she will paint the other three girls disappearing. And so she paints them in white nightgowns and she always paints them in the same order. And she will cover them up with leaves and branches until no one except her knows they're there. The only exception was the very first painting she did like that. She left just a tad bit of them visible, but all the other ones, they're completely covered up and she's the only one who knows they're there. So she goes back to Camp Nightingale and she's like, I'm gonna uncover this mystery. And so we see a lot of the old players from 15 years ago have returned. So there's Franny, who is the owner, and you're kind of not sure if she's a good guy or a bad guy throughout a lot of the book. Because again, as mentioned in the summary, Emma's trying to uncover all of this and you know, there, things aren't quite as it seems, but she really does like Franny. And so she's hoping she's not a bad guy, but she's not sure. And there's just a lot of uncertainty going on in Emma's brain. She just, she just doesn't know who to trust or where to turn. And then Franny has two sons. So Theo and Shed, they're both adopted. Theo, interestingly, so Emma had a massive crush on Theo when she was at the camp, but she was 13, I believe, when she went to the camp. And it was mostly a camp for like rich girls. She just went there like the one summer and then the other girls were, that ended up vanishing were more like your stereotypical like rich girls that went there every year. And it, it is an all girls camp. So Theo and Shet were the only ones that were there. So 15 years ago, Theo was 19 and Shet was 10, I believe. So Emma had this massive crush on Theo, which of course didn't go anywhere because she was 13 and he was 19, but now she it's 15 years later. And like, as soon as they introduce Theo, I'm like, I'm gonna call it, there's gonna be a relationship somewhere in here. There, like there's immediately like, romantic slash sexual tension between the two of them. I'm like, I will like, I will eat my socks if there is not some type of romantic relationship between them in, in some way, shape or form. I did not have to eat my socks. <laughs> we get glimpses throughout the book of what happened 15 years ago and it's kind of told in, it's told in tandem with what Emma's rediscovering in the present. So I thought that the way that the author unfurled it was really clever because it gave you just enough information to kind of form your own theories and opinions and just enough information to keep you invested. All right, so I kind of wanted, I wanted to try like drawing like little figures and covering them up with the makeup look, but I don't know, I don't know if I can do that. Here, hold on, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try. We'll see what happens. She does them in white, but well, we actually, I do have, I do have a white, eyeliner, don't I? There we go. Okay. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna try it. <laughs> very, very detailed. Very detailed. Uh, these are just white dots, but they represent Vivian, Natalie, and Allison. So, <laughs> they're drawn on there. There was a lot of reasons why they can't shut down, but part of it was, you know, the girls' bodies were never found. There's this whole aspect of mystery to it. But then also, Emma is partially, she feels herself to blame because of, she did something horrible 15 years ago. And at the beginning, we think it's related to Theo. So it turns out that she had blamed Theo reasons that are unfurled throughout the book. She had blamed Theo for the girl's disappearance and so he became a main suspect and his life kind of went haywire after and it took him a while to sort of get back on track. And we learn more about that throughout the book. And so throughout it, you know, Theo seems to, you know, have pretty much forgiven her. I wasn't really sure how, how to view that as a reader. I was like, do we trust him? Do we not trust him? Has he really forgiven her? Like, is, is he really willing to like start over, put it all behind him? Like, it's just, it's just hard to tell. I just realized I didn't show you the shade I was using. Spruced up. And then, you know, Shet's kind of in there. He's more in the background. His Emma is more concerned about Theo. Franny brought back a lot of these old players, familiar faces from the camp before. So Emma does know a lot of these people, with the exception of like Shet's fiance. I need a deeper green. Do I have a deeper green? I think I have one in my... <coughs> Like I need, I need that big, I need that big like forest green. So at the beginning, originally all of the counselors were going to stay in a cabin together, 
but there ended up being like one too many and so Franny to keep it fair decided that the counselors would share with the students and so I was like wait a minute so you're telling me that this camp doesn't have counselors stay in the cabins like I only ever went to like Bible camp so the rules I think were a lot stricter than portrayed in this one which they did mention that the counselors stayed with the younger girls but they did not stay with the older girls I was like yo any unsupervised anything would not like I just that was a completely foreign concept to me I was like wait is that normal that like older campers don't have like supervision from a counselor at, in their cabins like what <laughs> completely foreign to me anyway so that but that's how it went down in this book so the only thing that was a little weird that I wasn't so sure on writing wise was that it opened with second person which I don't really care for second person in writing um, I used to be more okay with it but just I don't know like as I've as I've gotten older I just I feel like it's very very hard to do well and since it like literally started out with second person I was like if this continues I don't know if I'm gonna make it through this whole book like it can <laughs> it's, please dear god tell me this whole book is not second person so there's only it has the beginning the transition and the end are told in second person and so I can see stylistically why the author did it it's, it's still not my favorite but like I understand so it's mm, yeah that's that's one of those things that's more of a my preference thing and I like it was fine I just I just don't like second person it's just so weird you know because it which I get that it's supposed to put you literally in the main shoes of the character but it just it just feels so off I, well partially just because you're not used to it I guess but just yeah mm -mm. Ooh, that's darker than I thought it was oh no 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 so the other thing that I wasn't sure about, and this is more coming from my like mental health background, was its portrayal of mental illness. So this book did do a lot, lot better than a lot of other books I've seen because generally speaking, in this sort of story, they would make the villain be the one that has the mental illness. So Emma has schizophreniform disorder. My kind of area of interest isn't really in the psychotic disorders, so I did have to like reread up on it. Like I went in, went into my well, I went into my full DSM, but I, this is this is easier. So schizophreniform disorder has two or more of the following each present for a significant portion of the time during a one month period or less if successfully treated at least one of these must be one two or three so delusions hallucinations disorganized speech grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior negative symptoms so that it would be like your diminished emotional expression or abolition an episode of the disorder lasts at least one month but less than six so less than one month would push it into brief psychotic disorder and more than six months would push it into schizophrenia. So that's basically the only difference, the amount of time that the episode lasts between those three disorders. It's not quite as well researched as its long-term as its long-term schizophrenia, but essentially it's, it's sort of the same. So I was like, okay, it's kind of cool to have your main character have a psychotic disorder and not be the bad guy. Like that's fairly unique, especially I feel like in suspense thriller books. So I was really, really happy with that, that I thought that was just, I thought that was really cool. So I was, I was quite happy with that. However, there were some misinterpretations of that specific disorder and just psychotic disorders in general. So Emma had been diagnosed with it after the traumatic events of the summer where the girls disappeared and she had full auditory and visual hallucinations of Vivian specifically. That was sort of what kicked it off and then she was in a mental hospital I believe for about six months and then she ended up being better and her hallucinations didn't start up again until she went back to Camp Nightingale 15 years later. So that to me was a little weird because and I know why she did it for a narrative perspective, but if you're going to put like the actual diagnosis to it, it's it just makes it a little a little more iffy. Because generally speaking, those psychotic disorders do have a very high genetic aspect to them. So having it show up after this like immediately after the stressor of this traumatic event, possibly that's not necessarily a big thing. Sometimes trauma can trigger 
uh, things you have a genetic proclivity for. That's That wasn't really my main issue. What was weird is, so what we know about psychotic disorders, and I stopped doing my makeup for a second, it's okay. What we know about psychotic disorders is that the younger you have your first episode, the more likely it is that your case is going to be severe as an adult. So Emma was 13 when she had her first psychotic episode. And this would generally mean that she is at a far higher risk of having a severe case of either schizo schizophreniform or schizophrenia as she gets older. So that, and then they mentioned, you know, she was on medications during her time at the psychiatric hospital, but then she got better, she didn't have any, uh, any type of medications, and for that 15 year period between the original events at Camp Nightingale and the start of the book, she was not, she didn't have any type of psychotic break. That would be extremely, extremely rare. Most people who have a psychotic disorder absolutely need to take their medications in order to remain stable. It's like having type 1 diabetes. If you don't take your insulin, you're not going to maintain your insulin regulation. It's not a matter of, oh, I, just, I flipped a switch, I'm better now, it's all good. So that kind of, that kind of thing would be very, very, very rare to have to have no sort of relapse or or anything without medication for that whole 15 year period. So that was my main issue with it. Also, just as a as a diagnostic sort of side note, just in general, full auditory and visual hallucinations are fairly rare. So they can happen, definitely, but they're very rare. So it would be more likely that she would just hear Vivian's voice but not see her or just see her, but you know, she didn't talk. And in this one, you know, she fully interacted with Vivian once the hallucinations started coming back. You know, there was just, I think, a little bit of literary liberty that the author took with the disorder in order to further the narrative, which to some degree I get. But to another degree, this, I think psychotic disorders are so badly represented that while I think this is a better representation than most, there's still a lot of work that people need to do to get an accurate representation of this disorder and psychotic disorders in general. So, you know, I think I think they really just need to be very, very careful about how these are represented in the mainstream before you can start taking any sort of creative liberties with the diagnostics or portrayal of of a disorder it, it was it was more nitpicky stuff and things that I wouldn't have necessarily known unless I had a background in mental health so it just again that's sort of nitpicky stuff but I, I tend to be fairly picky and staunch about how mental illnesses are portrayed in literature because they have this history of being so badly misrepresented but I also don't expect every author to be an expert on everything they try to portray. So I understand where some of the more confusion or uh, nuances of the disorder were misunderstood, but I just thought I'd make it a note. Alright, so from this point on there will be spoilers. I'm just gonna sort of go over. So if you want to skip ahead to the final look and thoughts, I will leave the timestamp down below. While well, you're down there, please like, comment, and subscribe. Was that, a, was that a wink or a wink? There we go. Alrighty. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. So there's sort of a couple different facets to the mystery. Why do I keep doing this? Hold on. As usual, I can't do eyeliner and talk. Alright, close enough. Okay, so, so obviously we're trying to solve the whodunit aspect of the mystery. So what happened to Vivian, Natalie, and Allison 15 years ago, and who did it. And of course a lot of the major players are still there, and there's sort of a supernatural aspect teased. So Vivian left cryptic clues in a diary that Emma finds a little bit through the book, and it seems like Vivian was, tr was trying to uncover the dark history of the camp. So we sort of see that journey as well and there's hints that it may be something mildly supernatural because we find out that there was an insane asylum built in the valley that Franny's great-grandpa turned into like midnight so it seems like there is a rumor like there's just many rumors not the insane asylum but but there's rumors that there was like a village of lepers or there was some type of settlement that 
he flooded in order to create the lake and it still lies beneath the lake and you know they know that it was a valley because you know there's still trees and stuff left behind but they don't know about the insane asylum so there's potentially this man who took advantage of um, these insane patients. His name was Dr. Charles Cutler and he potentially kept these people in the insane asylum, made all of these women like grow their hair out and then sold them to wig makers and this was in the early 1900s I think. So we're also trying to uncover this mystery as well. And then dealing with the conflict in the present. So about halfway through the book and this is a spoiler. So there is a twist that I actually did not see coming. So there's three girls that Emma shares the cabin with in modern day and she stayed in Dogwood which was the cabin that she stayed in. So there's three girls their names are Sasha, Crystal, and Miranda and so they are the campers that are in the camper in present day and they all have you know their personalities are portrayed very differently to what we see of Natalie, Allison, and Vivian but you can see that you know, Emma feels very protective of the girls, she likes them. So while the other two girls have fairly different personalities than Natalie and Allison, there is a fairly strong parallel drawn between Miranda and Vivian, at least in the eyes of Emma, who of course is who we're viewing everything through. But there was a twist halfway through the book that I was not expecting. So I told you, um, the beginning and the end are bookended with second person. And so they're both told, the first the first second person is told from Emma's point of view in the first first disappearance or yours as Emma's point of view because it's second person. Then the end it also has this narration. So then in the middle we get it again and it seems like it's a repeat of the beginning of the book where it's going through the girl's disappearance and then it it has Emma sitting down in front of the detective and explaining explaining the disappearance, which is a view that we hadn't gotten before. And then she says, it, like it went back to that second person of what you thought was the first disappearance. And then she says, their names are Sasha, Crystal, and Miranda. And so all of a sudden, we're like, holy crap, what's happening? Did I show you what I was using? I think I did. So all of a sudden, we're cast into this like holy crap things just got real in the present Ooh. it's not just trying to figure out what happened in the past it's these girls are in danger in the present so all of a sudden like the stakes just got really 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 high and so they obviously suspect Emma because again she's the only person that remained left behind they sort of tried to use her disorder her mental illness as a reason why she could potentially be dangerous which of course irked me to no end and of course you know we're from Emma's perspective so we know that she's innocent but you know the the detective is very suspicious of her and they think of her really as sort of the prime or the only suspect well Emma's in the midst of just being extremely confused and sort of sort of in the midst of suspecting everyone like she doesn't know who or what to trust she's just thrown into a loop and so she's like I have to figure out what happened I have to figure out what happened and you know there's this there's this part of you that's like are they gonna kill these kids like are they are they alive <laughs> what's happening and so there's there's lots of things that are revealed about what happened 15 years ago that were either misinterpreted at that time by Emma so for instance she, the reason she uh, accused Theo there was a hole in one of the showers like through the wall so Vivian had Vivian in the beginning had sort of taken Emma under wing and you could tell that Vivian was by far the most important to Emma so she sort of viewed her as the big sister she never had and we find out that Vivian lost her big sister in a drowning a few years back and so she kind of viewed Emma as a sister and so and Vivian was she's an interesting character and I think they did her the dynamicness of dynamicness is that a word i thought i thought they rounded her character fairly well and you could definitely view how you know little 13 year old emma would look up to just how great she thought she was and so like 15 years before vivian was like here i'll show you like this hole in the shower and so they peeped on theo and so the night before the disappearance emma had gone up 
like she had been looking for Vivian and she thought she heard some, like a noise coming through the shower. So she peeped in through that hole and, and thought she saw Vivian and Theo having sex, which made Emma really mad at Vivian because Vivian knew that Emma had a crush on Theo and she was just like, it was just this whole giant thing, which, you know, 13 year olds kind of, everything is big and dramatic. And so that kind of kickstarted everything. So we're also trying to figure out sort of what like what Emma's guilty about because she says she did something horrible. It wasn't just about accusing Theo of something that he probably didn't do. It was also about something terrible she did to the girls. And the girls play three truths and a lie all the time. And so we kind of are unraveling it. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna reveal too much about that bit just because I think it was really well done. And if you haven't read it yet, I really want you to be able to experience that for your for yourself. Um, so I I will say there were a lot of things that I sort of thought would happen, and then they were just kind of twisted, which I think is the most fun way to do a suspense thriller. You're kind of kept on the edge of your seat the entire time, which personally I really appreciate. I think that's I think that's a swell way to do it, you know? Sorry, this one's old, so I'm trying to use it up. I just thought, I just thought pretty much everything done with that reveal was really, really, really good. I, I have no qualms with that. So, the ending. So, of course, as soon as the three modern girls get stolen or get kidnapped or just disappear, everything gets kind of kicked into high drive. So, all of a sudden, Emma's like, okay, I have to figure out what's happening right now because she's kind of somewhat accused Franny and she's kind of somewhat accused Ben, which, oh, I forgot to mention, like, the they found out that it was Ben in the shower with Vivian all those years ago, not Theo, which, like, everything's just, everything's just sort of a mess. And so she has to sort of figure out all of this at once. And she goes back into the woods because the girls had kind of been along with her on this journey, even though she didn't want them there because she's like, this might be dangerous. All this dramaticness starts happening at the same time. And Emma's not sure where to turn. She's not sure who to trust. She's not sure what's, like, just, she doesn't know what's happening. And of course, as I mentioned, she's kind of the main suspect because, you know, the girls disappeared. And she was the only one left behind so there's this just there's just wow words there's just a lot of just sort of uncertainty going on and because it's from her point of view you you as the reader don't really know what's happening either and so I thought the way it was resolved was really really good you know you get a lot of development between Emma and the girls and then I would say you get the next most development between Emma and Theo and that's kind of your sort of primary because there's there's just so much history there with what Emma accused Theo of 15 years ago with who he is now and now he's a pediatrician he's you know fairly successful there's still a lot of this uncertainty can I stop chucking things across the room thanks so I think the development between Theo and Emma, as I, as I said at the beginning, I kind of knew from the start they were going to go the romance direction and I was not wrong. But I did think it was developed fairly well and a lot of the tensions between them I thought were fairly realistic, you know? It wasn't just immediately like, oh, I want to be with you because they have a lot of their past to work through, you know? Emma did accuse him of you know, harming the girls 15 years ago, and she never technically recanted it. Emma did, you know, do all this stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that they have to work through if it's going to be viable. And you don't get a certain answer at the end, which I like. They just kind of leave it at, okay, let's let's take this slow. Let's work together. Let's, you know, let's go on a date. And I liked that they took it really slow with that. I think that was one of my favorite things because I was like, with that much history, it's going to be like really, it's going to be really hard to convince me that this is... <laughs> a realistic like insta romance. So then we get to the end. So Emma finds the girls alive and then there's this big thing and they have to run away from Theo who they think is they think is the killer. But Theo is like I was just following you. I saw you disappear into the woods. I was worried about you. It wasn't me. I swear it wasn't me. And Emma ends up falling back into this cave and breaking her ankles. And it's, you know, she has to try and get out and she ends up just this really tense thing. You're like, I don't think she's going to die because we have to get a resolution, but this is obviously not a good situation to be in. It, it was just, it was very, very tense. And so she ends up finding a sort of tunnel out and she swims out and makes it out onto the lake and she's picked up by Chet. And then all of a sudden she, like, there's this big standoff and all of a sudden it turns out that 
Wait, do I want to say that? Yeah, I do. Okay, so, and this is obviously a massive spoiler, but this isn't the thing I didn't want to spoil. So, I, I don't know. Anyway, so Chet was the one who has been sort of terrorizing Emma her entire camp experience, making her think she's going insane again, doing all of this stuff. And he's the one who kidnapped the girls and he wants he wants revenge because Emma never recanted and she ruined their family's life because she made their family pretty poor because you know Franny had to pay out so much and lost the camp and pretty much ruined Theo's life. You know, he was just really messed up after the fact and got into drugs, almost killed himself, and then it took a really long time for him to get sort of back on track. And so with all of with all of this, we're just kind of getting this so he just he kind of explains these answers and then he's going to kill Emma. And he he basically kicks her out of I'm trying to remember what he does. Like does is he gonna hit her over the head with the Oregon? I don't know. But anyway, she ends up falling into the lake and finds the remains of the insane asylum and she sees bones and she know she sees the necklace that Vivian was always wearing and she's like <laughs> Oh my goodness, I felt like we know where they are. And people always kind of suspected that they would be in the lake, but because of how dangerous it was with all the trees and everything down there, they couldn't actually go down to investigate. But she got kind of this confirmation. And then of course she's saved. She doesn't get killed by chat, which is, you know, good. And they kind of do this whole wrap up and then it sort of fast forwards a bit. And she talks about seeing a therapist, which is good. She needs it after all that trauma she's had and you know, a mental illness on top of it. And so I was like, good, good on you. You have a therapist. Hopefully you're working through this stuff. <laughs> and she starts painting again because, oh, I guess that's one thing I didn't touch on. She did have sort of art block going through most of the book after she finished all of these forest paintings. She hadn't painted anything in about six months and was just feeling kind of blocked. So she starts painting again, which is awesome. And she starts painting underwater because, you know, she's, she's, got that closure about the girls. There was a twist at the end that I was not expecting in any, in any way, but I thought it was a good end. Uh, it, just, it just made me kind of sit there for a moment like, what? Excuse you, what? What? <laughs> be, be warned, there is, there is a twist. Yeah, I have not given by any means any of the, all of the stuff away. But yeah, I just, I really, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really well done. And as I mentioned, you know, it kind of, I'm just gonna use settings for So I think just the way it was written, the way it kind of ties together the plot, but also makes you care about the characters and what happens to them and kept the girls safe. They were alive. They were well. They didn't die. It made me really happy. And it makes you feel, it makes you feel sympathy for all of the characters, which I really appreciate. Uh, there's really not a character that you don't, that you don't feel for, which is good. So I think, I think suspense novels can tend to sort of fall into that all plot, no character sort of realm, but this book really doesn't. It's a character driven story, but also really, really heavily focuses on the plot and all the suspense and thriller stuff, but then also really subverts your expectations in a lot of ways that I was really happy about. I'm starting to think this might be too warm toned, but well, we'll see, because it's called Me vs. the World, so I thought it was appropriate given the story. Why do I always get gloss on that tooth? It's, it's just that tooth. Always oh, that tooth. All right, so this is the final look. So as you can see, I, I didn't really go for any specific era because the book kind of takes place between the early 2000s and modern day. So I was like, eh, I'm just gonna go more conceptual with it. As I mentioned at the beginning, I went with kind of the greens for the forest and a little bit of the blue because we have some aspects of the lake and the mystery with that. I'm just kind of general, fresh faced, nothing too crazy with the complexion. And as I mentioned, the gloss is called Me Versus the World. And it seemed to fit kind of a lot of those dynamics because it was either Vivian versus the world or Emma versus the world and there's just there's a lot of conflict that makes it seem like it's just this one individual pitted against everything else and I thought it was I thought it was interesting how they did that and the parallels they drew between Emma and Vivian between Vivian and Miranda there's just there's a lot of really well done parallels in this book which you know obviously takes me into my final notes so I would I thought this book was definitely really really good for a person who doesn't read a lot of suspense I thought it was really good it, it kept me on my toes without really making me 
like anxious which is something good like I mentioned I don't really watch suspense or thrillers I just I can't really handle it that well and so I can read more but it's I really like having that mystery aspect without having the anxiety aspect <laughs> so it was good to see it all kind of unfurl and of course there were tense moments especially when it came towards the end where everything was building and you had the climax like that was all very intense and well written but there was nothing too crazy that I couldn't handle which was good <laughs> There was a lot of depth to the characters that I appreciated. They all seemed fairly dynamic. Everyone had their own motives and alibis and everything. So it made the whole plot very complex to where you, you could have a lot of theories that could potentially work for what happened back then and now. And then also it, it just, it built really well. So you understood how it ended the way it did, but then throughout it you weren't ever completely certain. You're like, well it could be this, but it could be this, but it could be this, which I think makes a really good mystery and suspense book because you are kind of kept on your toes and you're figuring it out with the characters, which I really enjoy. So yeah, I would definitely recommend it. As I mentioned, there's always a few little things that, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of, so whether it's the second person or just kind of some picky stuff about the portrayal of the schizophreniform disorder, there's never going to be a perfect book, but I still think it was really good if you like suspense and thriller books or just mysteries in general I think you will probably really enjoy this one and that pretty much completes this book look I didn't go into as much detail as I thought I would like I have so many like really detailed notes and then I just was mostly general with a few exceptions but <laughs> whatever <laughs> who cares so that's pretty much it for today thank you so much for joining me I hope you all have an absolutely beautiful day stay magic keep reading and I love you so very much Goodbye.